uh, segment of the Turtles Pavlov project, I want to address a fairly common issue in uh, learning to play a musical instrument, namely the importance of practice. Why is it important to spend so much time practicing the instrument? On the face of it, this may seem like a silly question. The answer is obvious. You practice, you get better at it, and the more you practice, the better you get. And that's true about developing skill in all kinds of domains. I mean, you don't drive a car very well the first couple of times a uh, novice uh, driver tries it. And with practice, you get pretty good at it. Surgeons practice, car mechanics practice. You practice all kinds of things. So why should you not have to practice a musical instrument? Well, that's all true. Uh, but I think there is a more important uh, rationale a uh, psychologically more compelling reason that you have to practice a musical instrument. And this has to do with the fact that uh, playing a musical instrument is the ultimate multitasking problem. I mean, <laughs> people who have approached the issue of multitasking have not begun to deal with the complexities that are involved in playing an instrument. Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but, you know, multitasking has been in the news quite a bit, particularly with respect to uh, driving a car and uh, talking on a cell phone. In fact, uh, we're doing these recordings uh, on the campus of the University of Texas at Austin, here in the city of Austin, where the city council is considering passing a regulation that has already been put into effect in lots of other places and, and quite a number of countries. Uh, simply uh, outlaw uh, using a cell phone while you're driving. If a cop sees you with the phone against your ear, you get ticketed. And so the recommendation is that you uh, use a, a device that doesn't require holding it up to your uh, ear. Turns out that doesn't solve the, uh, the problem. People who uh, talk on the phone have uh, a a deterioration in their performance in driving that's a, that moves them down to the level of someone who's legally drunk. I mean, the impairment is, is severe. And uh, uh, you don't overcome that impairment by using a, a, a cordless device. And the reason for that is that the impairment is due to a limitation of the brain. Uh, I asked my students uh, whether they considered uh, themselves to be good at multitasking, and everybody raises their hand. And they're just uh, being unrealistic. Nobody is good at multitasking. There's nobody who's got the brain for it. The brain is not designed to consciously monitor and do a lot of things at the same time. The number of things that you can consciously pay attention to and make conscious decisions about is pretty limited. So how do you achieve uh, a task that requires doing a lot of things at the same time? And playing a musical instrument is, is, is just, I mean, it'd be almost, I bet it'd be impossible to write a computer program that does all the things the nervous system has to do to allow you to play a violin or a viola. I mean, you have to stand to begin with. <laughs> pretty, pretty basic, right? Turns out, that involves a lot of complicated things. And we, we don't pay attention to that, we ignore it, and we take it for granted because we've practiced standing and walking so much that we no longer have to think about it. But if you had a stroke and it affected your ability to stand and walk, you'd have to relearn to do those things and, uh, and you would quickly realize how complicated uh, simply standing is. In fact, it's so complicated that a stroke victim who is in rehab and has to le relearn to walk can't, be, can't engage in a conversation at the same time that they're trying to walk. It's like driving and talking at the same time. If you, your conscious brain is devoted to trying to move one foot in front of the other or is devoted to maintaining balance so you don't fall over, uh, you don't have excess brain capacity to carry on a conversation. 
uh, and it's kind of interesting. So, uh, well, the reason you have to practice things a lot is to move skills and perform levels of performance from the range of conscious control to autom automatic unconscious performance. And this has to do with holding the instrument. I mean, it has to do with where you put your fingers. I mean, uh, one of the uh, neuroscientists have fun <laughs> trying to analyze uh, uh, musicians who play fast notes because it's, it's really hard to design a computer program to figure out how, how that's done. Well, you can't do it by thinking about each finger and where that finger is going to go. Uh, those finger placements have to be so well practiced that they occur automatically. So you've got finger placements on, on the left hand. Of course, you've got pressure of the bow, just how you hold the bow, whether the bow goes you know, up bow, down bow, <laughs> all kinds of complications. And we haven't even started talking about how you uh, uh, try to uh, create a, a, uh, a beautiful phrasing and a beautiful musical interpretation uh, of a melody. That's another level of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the task of playing an instrument. So playing an instrument is awfully complicated. And uh, a lot of the practice that's required it has to take place to automate many of these routines. You have to automate these routines. And then the next question is, well, how much practice should you do? <laughs> and the uh, psychologists who study these kinds of things are going to tell you, <laughs> the more the better. One of the things that's really clear from a standpoint of trying to automate a, root, a complex motor routine is that you have to go well beyond uh, the level of mastery. That is, once you've mastered a musical passage, you're not done practicing it. You have to keep playing it over and over and over again to move that mastery into this realm of automated, uh, automated performance. Uh, so you have to practice well beyond uh, the level of mastery. And uh, for that reason, I, I really favor uh, time-based uh, practice routines. Because if you decide, okay, I'm going to practice this particular passage for, for 30 minutes, <laughs> it's deadly boring probably to do that. Um, but you're more apt to move the performance into the realm of the automatic uh, then if you just practice it until you feel pretty good about it, until you can play it just fine in the comfort of your uh, practice room, that, of course, doesn't mean you're going to play it fine <laughs> in a uh, performance venue. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to have to think about how you play it. And that the more you think about playing it, the more it's going to interfere with where you should be devoting your attention, which is the musicality and the phrasing and how to turn the, the, the notes on the page into something really beautiful instead of just a series of notes. Uh, so that's where a uh, performer needs to devote their attention to, uh, and they need to be able to play the instrument to the, it so well that they can pretty much ignore all the technical features of, of, having, of having to play the instrument. And the other thing that's interesting about it is, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, discussion about the relative role of practice versus talent and musical performance and all like that. Uh, I'm not, uh, we we uh, may have a, uh, a video segment uh, on that particular issue, but the important thing to keep in mind uh, at this point is that even the most talented people are not immune from these requirements. That is, their brain is no better at multitasking <laughs> than mine or yours. And this multitasking uh, constraint on musical performance uh, is, is just as severe. So, I mean, one of the most telling uh, uh, memories that I have from uh, my, my uh, early days in, in music training is uh, my music teacher, Louise Barron, came back uh, from a concert one time, Carnegie Hall, and uh, Isaac Stern was playing the uh, Brahms a violin concerto with the New York Philharmonic, and she came back, reported back to us, and said, boy, Isaac Stern hadn't been practicing much lately. 
I mean, Isaac Stern was one of the most prominent American violinists uh, in the 20th century, and he, he, you know, he was a spectacular violinist. But even he was not immune from practicing. So in closing uh, this video segment, I'm going to play for you something that took a lot of practice. This is uh, Paganini's Perpetual Motion, which is a lot of things uh, that I play was not written for the viola, it was written for the violin. And it involves a lot of notes. It involves 2,200 16th notes that just go on and on and on and on. <laughs> and uh, when I started playing this, I, 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 I practicing this thing, I thought, I'm never going to learn to play this thing. And, and uh, you be the judge. <laughs> Maybe I haven't learned it well enough. But I'm going to give it a try, and it involves a lot of, lot of practice. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 